Hello there. Since I started shooting film in 2021, I've accumulated quite a lot of film cameras. Some of them, such as this and this, are dog shit. Just awful. Some of them are fine but aren't inspiring. And then there are good cameras that take good photos, but they're missing something that gets them into the top 10. They're lacking the most important ingredient, and that is character, which is why this, the Canon A1, one of the most popular SLRs ever made, isn't on the list. Sure, they may have sold around 6 million of these, and Wikipedia may describe it as historically significant, but for me, it's just a bit bland and predictable. It's got no personality, and these are my rules, and it's not coming in. So what is coming in? Well, let's start at 10 and count down to my favorite film camera. If you're looking to get into film but don't yet understand all the various settings, then this is a great place to start. The 1974 Hymatic is stripped back and simple. All you have to do is choose from one of four focus distances, a close-up person, a person further away, a small group, or a mountain. And the camera takes care of the rest. I often got that wrong, but it doesn't matter because this is a camera for memories, not perfect images. A needle inside the viewfinder shows its preset combinations of aperture and shutter speed, so you can see if things might get a bit extreme for your liking. I picked this up as one of my first film cameras in a charity shop for about £20 and used to carry it everywhere. Its size means I can keep it in my coat pocket for any spontaneous moments I want to capture. For £20, it delivers so much. If the Minolta was simple and easy, then the Zorki is the polar opposite. There's no light meter here, so you have to manually expose and set your aperture, shutter speed, and focus yourself. And it's a bit of a workout, basically a USSR built copy of the Leica 3, made in a factory near Moscow from 1956. It's built like a Soviet tank, and you can feel the history with every turn of the dial. These were not seemingly designed for comfort. The knurled knobs can need a bit of finger strength and leave as much as an imprint on your skin as the camera will on the film. But it's something I love. It's a reminder that what you're doing is practical and there's no electronic wizardry here. You're setting these mechanical processes in place to capture an image, just like the original users did almost 70 years ago. Firstly, apologies for not having the same fancy footage of this, but that's because this camera is now in the hands of my son doing his photography GCSE. Now, point and shoots aren't really my thing, but I bought this untested for next to nothing and took it on a road trip across Cornwall and Devon. And you know what? It absolutely exceeded all my expectations and captured cracking photos in all sorts of settings. I made a video about it. You can watch in the link above or below or wherever it appears. So you can see more of it there. But for a basic little camera, which does absolutely everything for you, this will have a sentimental place in my heart. I don't claim to be the smartest man on the planet. And there's a lot of technical things about cameras I don't understand or appreciate. But what I do appreciate is how small and cute this thing is. The video may not do it justice, but the body of this is smaller than my iPhone. And weirdly, the viewfinder is huge, bigger apparently than any Nikon SLR ever. This is another stripped back camera, which is weird for someone like me who likes to usually be fully manual, but it works so well. You choose the aperture and the camera determines the shutter speed. This is a nice discreet camera for street photography that's quick to use when you whip it out. If I'm being totally honest, what attracted me to film photography originally was not only the concept of going back to chemical processes and using cameras with manual dials, but also that classic film cameras look f***ing cool. Which is why the short, which is why the sure shot, oh god, which is why the sure shot Zoom XL is such a weird choice for me. It's fully automatic, again, Jesus, and the design is so obviously from the 80s when they imagined this is how cameras of the future would look. It's unbalanced and such a weird shape, but you know what? It's bloody brilliant in the hand and takes great photos. Canon says the quality of the lens is comparable to Canon FD interchangeable lenses, which are fantastic and now much sought after. The zoom on this goes from 39 to 85 mil and is brilliant and always puts a smile on my face as the lens gets erect. And it even has a tiny remote that slides out from the bottom. Oh dear, where's this going? To take group selfies, a chunky favorite. I fell in love with this camera when I found out about it, so much so that there are now three in my house. 
Known by some as the Spider-Man camera after it was used by Peter Parker in The Amazing Spider-Man, this is a beautiful camera from the 60s and 70s when Yashica sold 8 million of them. I can talk about how I love the rangefinder focusing or how nice and clear the over and under exposure lights are when shooting or even about the build quality, but the reality is I am sexually attracted to this camera. It screams 1960s and is flawless from every angle. It even has an atomic symbol on the front because it's so futuristic and maybe has radioactive material in the lens. It needs a bit of a hack to get modern batteries to work with it and commonly suffers from a thing called the pad of death. But shooting street photography with it is just a joy, like kissing a supermodel in public and knowing people are watching and thinking, that lucky b****. Made in 1959, the F was Nikon's first SLR camera, one of the most advanced at the time. I've just stolen that from Wikipedia. It was popular among professional photographers covering the Vietnam War and also given to NASA astronauts. But what made me fall in love with it is the waist level finder. Sure, that makes you look pretty cool in an Instagram photo or reel, but it also has real world benefits. One of those is shooting street photography. People are less suspicious because you don't have a camera up to your face. You can keep the camera at waist level, the clues in the name, and set your shot and no one really knows you're snapping away. The prism is interchangeable too, so you can swap the waist level finder for a traditional viewfinder if you prefer. After spending a bit of time shooting and developing 35mm film, naturally I wanted to explore what else was out there. The next step is often medium format film, which is basically a bit bigger, almost twice the size. And everything on the Mamiya is bigger too. Bigger winder, bigger dials, bigger shutter button, and of course, a bigger body. Yes, she's a big old beast, but she's a beauty. It came out in 1975, and like the Nikon F, you can change both lenses and viewfinders. This is not a camera you sling around your neck for a walk on the off chance you want to snap something. This is meant for more deliberate shots, and truth be told, I've not properly shot it yet. The first roll, we discovered the lens was faulty in many ways, and after a costly repair, it's time to use it properly. But just holding it and shooting it briefly, it's such a different experience. Every clunk and click is bigger, the mirror slap is as big as the weight, and I can't wait to load this up again. There will always be a special place in my heart for this camera, but despite the story I'm about to tell you, I think it's at this spot on merit. This was my first film camera I owned as an adult, a gift from my girlfriend for a big milestone birthday, made the same year I was, which is long ago. And it set the bar for every camera that followed, and many have come up short. Firstly, it's a good size, not overly big, but not particularly small. Then it's damn good looking. That red and black snakeskin leatherette is a bit of me, a child of 80s rock. So far, so very good, but it's the rest of the camera that elevates it here. The dials are the easiest to read and move that I've had my hands on. The shutter button sits discreetly inside the shutter speed dial. The F2 lens is great. It has an auto exposure mode to set shutter speed for you. The exposure metering is triggered by a dedicated button and the way the metering readouts work is one of the best for me. It's just great to use and I love it. It actually makes me wonder if it should have been in first place. Before I reveal my favourite, I just want to re-emphasise that this is not an objective list of the best 10 film cameras of all time. This is just my personal favourites based on my own weird quirks and preferences. You will have your own and I'd love to hear about them in the comments. And typically, while this list isn't about expensive cameras being the best, my number one choice is from a brand that will make people tart and say, well, of course you went for that. But despite the manufacturer's name on it, I still think it's an unusual choice and not the obvious model people would pick. So groaning in three, two, one. I shouldn't own this camera. I got lucky when someone at a camera fair sold it at a price that was too ridiculous to turn down. This usually has a 50mm f2 Summicron lens on it, but I love it so much I've adapted it to fit my modern mirrorless cameras to film these camera clips on. The lens is fast, sharp and incredibly well made, and such an important part of the recipe that puts this camera in the top spot. But it's the body that really elevates it. Let me say though that I don't care that it says Leica. I'd rather be seen with that sexy Electro, to be honest. It's the build quality and how this camera operates that wins for me. 
It's similar to the Yashica FXD in many ways as a fully manual camera, but there's a few extra things I appreciate. I made a video about how I found it too. When looking through the viewfinder, you can see the shutter speed and aperture settings not only bounced into the finder by a dedicated lens, but also illuminated. That saves having ever to lower the camera to check them. There's a depth of field preview lever. You can see the film stock through a rear window. You can choose between averaged or spot metering, and it can also keep working if the battery dies as it's not dependent on the limited electronics. Also, the shutter sound is delightful. There's a lot to Leica. Sorry. There we go then, yes, I chose Leica. Quirkiness can only get you so far, so it's always good to have a favorite that can produce good images that you enjoy using at the same time. I'd love to hear what your top choices are, whether that's just your number one or your complete top 10. There are no rights and wrongs. If you like this video, please give it a like, thumbs up and all that. If you really liked it, then consider subscribing if you'd wanna see some more, or even better, share it with a friend. Bonjour.